is the Spurs Cast with your host, Paul Garcia. Welcome back to another episode of the Spurs Cast. On today's episode, I'll be speaking with Project Spurs writer Colin Reed. In this episode, Colin and I ponder what the Spurs are going to do with their remaining cap space, discuss Victor Wimbanyama's short summer league run, and how the other Spurs players have been doing in summer league. I do want to know before we begin this discussion that Colin and I are recording this episode at 1.30 p.m. Central Time on a Thursday. So if any news breaks that we didn't discuss in this episode, then you all know why we didn't address that. All right, let's go to jump right into this episode with Colin. Colin, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, looking forward to the Spurs to make a deep and long summer league playoff push. <laughs> uh, just kidding. But it, it is, it's been an exciting time uh, to, to kind of like follow the Spurs and analyze the Spurs, especially with the summer league. You know, I know you and I have covered summer league for quite a while. We actually met at summer league yes. originally. And um, I feel like a lot of the times the Spurs have, you know, two, maybe three guys that would even like sniff time on their roster. And they're going to be mostly Austin guys. So the fact that their whole starting lineup is like relevant players, even when Wimby's not playing, that's been a treat. I have loved to actually get to watch the games and say, okay, that player is going to be on the main roster next year. And so this is actually valuable information, <laughs> man. Uh, I'll tell you, I, you're right. I just, uh, I was just going down memory lane the other day. So I was actually in Vegas for a few days. Uh, I, I didn't go there as media. I went there. Um, uh, my fiance and I went down there. I mean, went up there, should I say from where we're located anyway, just like walking to the hotels and like just all the stuff, like going back to Thomas and Mac, like I, I just remembered all those memories of how I met you. And then, you know, um, just like everybody else that, that I've been in the media those days. Mm-hmm. So really, it was just a really a fun time, just even though it was a short few days that I was there. All right, man, let's go to begin here. Uh, first topic though, I do want to discuss, cause this is more of a time sensitive topic and that's uh, what are the Spurs doing with their cap space? So I'm going to go through a few theories with you and see if, um, if, if you, you know, where, where your brain's at on this. So first let's talk about some moves that they made. So last week on the Spurs cast, I discussed that they officially sign uh, Julian Champagne. They officially traded for Chetty Osman and Lamar Stevens. So those players' numbers are already now on the books. Well, on Wednesday, yesterday, the Spurs finally completed the three-team trade with the Boston Celtics. So they acquired Reggie Bullock's $10.5 million deal into their cap space as well. So now he's his, his deal is set in stone. They still haven't signed Trey Jones and Sandra Mamu Kalashvili as of, what is this, 1246 Central Time? which means that they can still operate with up to $15.5 million in cap space. Now, some other notes we want to make is that they still haven't signed CD Sissoko. Uh, he's a second round pick that they drafted. We've seen him in summer league. He can either come in that we think that he'll come in on a two way, or maybe they'll give him a full roster spot. That's been reported out of France. And also Dominic Barlow, who's been shining in, in the summer league is still out there as a restricted free agent where he can return to the Spurs on a two way or see if um, San Antonio or another team will give him a full roster deal. So uh, let's let me just get your thoughts real quick before we go into some of the uh, options that with, with that fifteen point five million dollars in space. What are your thoughts on Sissoko and Barlow, and what you think the Spurs are are going to do with those two players? Yeah, I think um, I think that Sissoko and Barlow are probably going to be signed to the two way mm-hmm. uh, spots, the two remaining ones. I was looking at the Spurs uh, roster spots that they have available on their like you know main fifteen man non two way roster spots, and even if they wave uh, um, Lamar Stevens and um, Kim Birch. It's mm. still going to be like, I think that still caps them out at 15. So that that's pretty tough in that regard. I think, you know, the fact that they have not yet signed Mamu, but specifically Trey, I think goes to show you that they are holding out for the possibility of something. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that we're about to discuss the something a little bit more, but it, it, they would have to to make a move where there are more players going out than coming in for them to sign either Barlow or Sissoko to the main roster. And right now, I don't see that happening. So that that's kind of where I'm at on that. I, I feel like you know they're they're probably going to get the two way spots again this summer. Okay, I'm with you there. Where I think that Sissoko is probably going to be in a two way. Um, and then just because of the, 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 not like I put this on Twitter yesterday, the number of wings this team already has, like the two and the three, it's, it's insane. Like there's going to be really good players, not every night on the Spurs roster that aren't going to play like, like, you know, Reggie Bullock might not play Chetty Osman, um, you know, Malachi Brown, I mean, I get to submit it. It's that kind of a roster where there's and Julian Champagne, who's been shining at some like, Some of these players are going to sit on, on most nights. It's crazy. Just looking at the depth they have there at the two and the three. And so that's why 
I feel like, yes, he's shown some, we're going to talk about him later, but he's shown some strides defensively, Sissoko, but I, I do feel like he's, he's too raw offensively to give him a full roster spot. Let him see what he can do in Austin for a year. Uh, Barlow, I just think it's more so is another team pitching him a spot. Like if another team sends him that qualifying offer to, hey, come sign here for a full roster spot, then I think the Spurs do match it. But for now, if, if nobody sends him an offer, then I think he ends up just coming back. He has to take San Antonio's qualifying offer and comes back on a two-way. All right, so now let's talk about some options they have uh, with that $15.5 million in cap space, again, until Trey Jones and, and Mamu sign their deals. So I went back to your original list that you and I talked about about two or three weeks ago, where we looked at the, you, you had listed a bunch of free agents that, um, that you, you had put some metrics together to figure out why, why they call, I mean, why you thought they were interesting free agents. And so there are still four players left on the board here. There's PJ Washington, who, who's expected to get, he was projected before free agency to get about 16 to $18 million annually, according to Bobby Marks. Um, there's no teams with that kind of cap space, not even the Spurs. So um, the, the latest reports that he's disgruntled with with uh, Charlotte's offers, and he's gonna he's gonna probably just sign their qualifying offer like Miles Bridges, and then become an unrestricted free agent next year. So that's what it looks like with Washington. Then you have Bismack Biombo, Kendrick Nunn, and Terrence Davis, who are all expected to just get the minimum. So they're still out there in free agency. Now, watching Wemby in two summer league games, I did note, and you noted this a lot on Twitter, was how they really wanted him to play out on the wing more so, especially defensively on the, at the 3-4 kind of play area. They wanted to keep him up top a lot. And so because of that, I'm not sure if maybe they want to save their cap space to maybe do a deal where they get like a starting level center and maybe bring Zach Collins off the bench, or if Zach starts and one of these players that I'm about to discuss uh, is that is the, the second big behind him so that, cause I think they do got to have, uh, um, you know, two or three bigs there on the roster at, at, the, at the five. Cause I think they definitely want Wemby at the three or four kind of area. So let's just talk about first starting centers who fit into their cap space. There's Jonas Valanciunas uh, out of the Pelicans who has $15.4 million on his deal next year. And there ha he has been in trade rumors. So it looks like New Orleans is trying to move his contract. There's Wendell Carter Jr. The magic at 13 million. Uh, Daniel Gafford of the Wizards, 12.4 million. James Wiseman of the Pistons at 12.1 million. Avika Zubak at 10.9 million. Um, he's been in trade rumors according to Hoops Hype, uh, or Rogium, my apologies. And then Mark Williams of the Hornets at 3.9 million. Then there's starting centers uh, where more cap space is needed, where the Spurs will probably have to send out a contract or two to open that cap space. There's um, there's Yusuf Nurkic uh, at 16.8 million. We've heard that that if Dame gets moved, that they want to attach his contract to to whatever you know to that to that big trade. Uh, there's Jared Allen of the Cavs, 20 million. Uh, he's been in, in some trade rumors. Clint Capella, 20.6 million of the Hawks. He's been in some trade rumors. And then um, DeAndre Ayton of the uh, of the Suns, he, he's not in trade rumors anymore, but we know that he was going into free agency, but they couldn't really move his contract. And that, to, to get Aiden, the Spurs have to send on multiple, you know, a larger contract. Um, now, there, there's been a fan question I've been getting a lot on Twitter. It's like, you know, uh, will the Spurs be that third team who takes in Tyler Hero? They could be that third team, but it takes probably waving uh, and stretching two players or trading two players out with, with you know, bigger salaries, not just like you're, you know, you're not, not like a Charles Bassey type player. We're talking like Ken Burt's salary and, and somebody else like with a substantial salary um, over like north of five million. So I know that's a lot of players, Colin. Um, we do know the Spurs' um, assets are probably, you know, they have multiple first round picks, of course. They have... Um, a lot of second round picks. They also have uh, like Ken Burch's salary. Maybe they can want to try to move or Lamar Stevens players like that. Um, are there any of these players intrigue you, whether that's starting at the five or coming off the bench or, or somebody like hero? What are, what are your thoughts there with that $15.5 million in cap space? Uh, Valentinus, I think does intrigue me specifically for the fact that he's, you know, been in reporting specifically linked to the Spurs. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that interests me about that though, is the Pelicans are an ascending team. They're mm -hmm. not like a rebuilding or yeah. a whatever team. So they would be looking for a talent upgrade. You know, like when you're evaluating what would teams take back, they're not going to say, oh, you know, just give us, you know, draft capital 10 yeah. years in the future. That's not what they care about right now. They care about getting better around Zion and Brandon Ingram. So what is the price going to be? where maybe it can be one of their not so good firsts or a handful of seconds, but they're probably also going to want to take back a player. Is that a Reggie block? Like I, I, that's, that's one of those things where maybe they need an extra shooter on the wing around Zion. Is that something that they're looking at? And that, that one is interesting to me specifically because they, he's been linked to the Spurs. Those in a trade target that they have on their board, but I'm not quite sure how they get that done. Um, I think, you know, they, they've kind of mentioned a lot of the reporting mentions those like veteran and the bigger guys. But, you know, the young guys here, your window Carter Jr. and your Mark Williams, uh, I, I feel like those are players with a lot of promise, a lot of intrigue, mm -hmm. a lot of potential. 
Um, they don't really fit what the Spurs have been rumored to be looking for, but I think for me personally, that's a really exciting get. You know, you take the lottery tickets, and if one of them pops, then you have your starting center for the next. And Wendell Carter is more than a lottery ticket. He's already proven he can play at that high level. But uh, I think the use of Nurkic one is interesting because the the Spurs, and I know that this would start to get really into cap minutiae. The Spurs would have to start sending out two or three players. Mm -hmm. But the Spurs could make themselves valuable as a third team in a Portland trade by taking on both Tyler Hero and Yusuf Nurkic. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. And that that would like require a little bit more finagling, but they they would be able to get uh, a starting veteran center, which is something they want. They'd be able to add some shooting and kind of a young developing wing prospect um, who's already like played at a high level. I, I'm not quite sure I see that happening, but if if the the Miami Heat and the Portland Trailblazers need a third team to get it done. Uh, both of the contracts that are kind of the you know black sheeps in this situation where Portland doesn't want to take on Tyler Hero and they want to send uh, Yusuf Nurkic out. I think the Spurs could be the landing place for either or both of them. So I, I think that that's interesting in that regard because you know I think the Spurs might end up in this blockbuster trade if and when it happens. Um, now it kind of, uh, sinks for, for Trey Jones and Mamu that they're kind of waiting on whatever happens yeah. with Miami. You know, if, if we hear like Portland says we are sticking to our guns, we're going to take them into the season. Then I would imagine that within a couple hours, you know, we have officially signed Trey Jones to mm -hmm. the contract of, <laughs> so I think they're probably just seeing what happens with this Portland situation first, but yeah, I, I would say. Jonas Valanciunas just because they've been linked to him and then Yusuf Nurkic just because I think they make sense as a third team in that Portland trade. Okay, uh, I'm I'm agree with you. So I'm going to go in and say something real quick like, like about what uh, what you just mentioned there. Like the, the minute that Jones and Mamu sign their deals, that cap space shrinks to 5.5 million about that range. So that's why it is important to, even though, you know, for them, it's like, because I've been getting that question too, of like, why haven't they signed? Why haven't they signed? It's like, they're it's a cap reason. Like they're, they're waiting for, for a reason. Because yeah, you're right. Once they sign those deals, that's it. Like that, that's, that's the number that's inked there on, on the, on the cap sheet. Now I'm actually with you as well, where I think they want more of those bigger bruising kind of centers who can, you know, take, take like some, some physical force from like players like Embiid, like Jokic. So that's why I think Jonas with Valanciunas would be that player or someone like Yusuf Nurkic. It wouldn't be hard to, to make those deals happen. Uh, I'm also looking like, you know, what would the Spurs send back? Obviously, you know, some teams want those first round picks, some, uh, some donors or second round picks. Uh, I would also think that maybe like, cause you're, you're taking one of these teams starting bigs, you're probably sending back someone like Zach Collins most likely. So that's also something, something to look at. And then I don't know if San Antonio would get to that question of wanting to trade Keldon Johnson for, for a player um, that's like higher than, than, uh, than what they have, like some, someone like a, like a, in the uh, DeAndre Ayton slash like Jared Allen, Clint, Clint Capella range. I don't think they're going to get either of those players. And there's more starting centers in the league, but I just narrow, narrowed it down to players who I think the Spurs might be able to, to swing a deal for. But but again, uh, I'm with you where I think it's, if, if anything, it's Jonas and, um, and Nurkic. And then uh, very sim similar thoughts on Tyler Hero where, uh, I mean, I, I went through some crazy cap gymnastics just to get him on the Spurs without trading players. And it would take waving and stretching Ken Birch and uh, – who is it? Somebody else. Uh, some, somebody. Oh, yeah, I forgot who else it was. But there was two players you would have to wave and stretch and, and just to make that happen. So it's it's a lot of it's a lot of, of juggling things right now. But uh, we'll kind of see what happens. And so yeah, they're, that they have that fifteen point five million in cap space. It, it does intrigue me to see what they're going to do with it um, for now. So so we'll see what happens there uh, with the Spurs in their cap space. All right, Colin, let's talk about Wemby game two observations. So Victor, so I, I, I talked extensively about game one for him where he really struggled. We saw, you know, I think it was like two or 13 shooting. And then on Sunday, which is one of the one that I was there in person. Wow. It was, he really, I mean, had a great, it was just fun to be there. Cause man, I got to experience that. That was, that was awesome to see him uh, go off there. So he plays 27 minutes on Sunday. Uh, he shoots nine of 14 from the floor, two of four from three, seven to 12 from the free throw line. Uh, 27 points, 12 rebounds, three blocks, one steal, three turnovers, one foul, just a, a really impressive game for him. And then from there, the Spurs, um, you know, initially we, 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 I, I was, I was hearing that they were only going to play him two games. And so they, they did follow through where they played him just two games and now he's done for summer league. Um, and then we won't see him again till, till training camp and preseason. So I just want to ask you, you just your initial thoughts, like what, and you could also talk about game one if you want to as well, but what stood out to you about Wemby and his, his two summer league games, um, anything good, anything bad? What are your, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. So I, it's interesting to me because I think we use labels 
um, on different situations or players or anything, because I think it makes it easy to talk about. It's kind of like a shortcut. And so before the draft, you had what would you call him the best prospect yeah. in, in any team sport. Oh, he's the best prospect since LeBron. He's a, he's a phenom. And people who weren't able to watch him play in France, when they think, oh, this amazing prospect, oh, this amazing phenom, I think the shortcut their brain takes is he's going to be this extraordinary offensive player. And I think like Tim Duncan, I think the offense is variable. And where that variable ends up determines if he's like an all-star, all-NBA. Well, I think even with the defense alone, he could be all-star. Let me correct that. Like all-NBA, you know, best player in the NBA kind of level. That's going to be like, where does the offense end up? Is it where the handle gets a little tighter and the passing vision and execution gets just a step quicker and that shooting gets there? Now, all of a sudden, he's going to be, you know, like candidate for best player in the NBA every single year. I think some of what you saw in that second game were flashes of just that. Um, but I think the other thing is where he is a phenom, where he's going to come in day one and be a huge difference maker is on defense. And we yep. saw that. That was very exciting to watch. I think, you know, I don't want to get hyperbolic, but I think he could be the best low man in NBA history in the sense of like in a pick and roll where you have the the screen defender and the big defender and then you have the low man who's the closest guy to the paint and they mm -hmm. rotate over to help the fact that he can close out with his eight foot wingspan block a three or he can rotate over and guard at the rim i think that he could be the best player to play in that spot in nba history just with his tools mm -hmm. um and he was already showing that so like day one the spurs defense is going to get some degree better you, five points defensive rating when he's on the, I don't know it's gonna be a big thing and what excites me about that too is the team that he was on Mets 92 they before he came on their team were a lower team in the French League they weren't this super successful team they weren't a winning team mm -hmm. came on this came on to the Mets 92 and took them to the finals so yes. that yes. defense is very very exciting we saw that defense I think that the offense was messier because they let him do whatever he wanted. They let him get into his bag. I think they could have said, hey, just be a spot-up shooter, or hey, just be a screener and roller, and his offense would have maybe looked better stat-wise, but um, it was exciting to see him try things. When it was working out, it was very beautiful. Uh, when it wasn't working out, it was kind of ugly, but the defense was just, I mean, incredible. You know, that's what we had, that's the, the, bill of goods that the Spurs were sold was that he was going to be this phenomenal defender from day one. And even in imperfect conditions, just phenomenal defense already from the first game, the second game, it was still there. Just incredible. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm going to share some of my observations as well uh, for, from offense first. And then I'll talk about a little bit of a concern for me. It's not really his play. Uh, it's, it's more of the people around him, the players around him. And uh, yeah, it's a little worrying. Some. So let's talk about first some of the positives. Just, I mean, some of the things that I, I noted was just that one play where he misses the floater. He goes back on the other side and, and collects it, then gets the N one. I mean, just, I just noted here, he's just anywhere he's in the pain of vicinity, he's a threat. Like it's insane. Like, especially that one two where he's on the fast break, he catches it like five feet out. The guy's right under him and he so just matches it on him. Like, <laughs> man, once he gets good in that and figures out the timing, his teammates understand where he's gonna get the ball best. He's gonna be a threat. And and at first I thought it was like too early to say, oh, like Giannis can do these kind of things. Like when I was saying this last week on the Spurs cast by myself. And then I heard Zach Lowe of ESPN, who I really, you know, I really look up to as a media person. And he was even saying those, some of those similar, similar um, comps as well in certain situations. And so I think just, yeah, like you see that the, the, the potential, I'm not going to say he's ready yet on offense. Like you said, there's parts where it's very messy. Um, some of the shots, I know they look cool, but and it's probably not the best shot you want to be taking in a game. Um, and so, yeah, he's just got a lot of potential offensively. It's just things that, I, that you know, that, that again, remind me very much of like what, what, what Giannis can do. The part that's worrisome to me, like I said, is just uh, the, 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 the way that teams aren't going to be able to understand how to close him out every night. Like, I just feel like I'm very worried about him getting injured. I'm going to knock on wood that he doesn't, but man, I, I'm even going back to game one. He, there was just multiple plays where he ends up on the floor. Cause somebody's like sliding under him. There was a play where he got reviewed. They thought that the guy, you know, rolled, I mean, put his feet, foot under, they, they said it wasn't a, a flagrant foul, but I think just, and, 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 and yes, you have to be careful, obviously, as, as a defender, but man, he's going to see 30 different defenders, actually like 60, if you think about it, 30, 30 uh, teams, but then times two, there's like two guys probably guarding him every night um, as his main, as his main player. So he, 60 different defenders got to learn how to 
give him his space, but also learn how to like contest the best that they can. And I think that's just going to be tough every night that he sees different defenders. So that's what I'm just worried about is more his physicality. Now they did note um, some of the, the media that's been covering him since his days in France, that other teams in, in the, in the, in the French league had that, that issue as well, where they basically went under him a lot and, and put him on the foul line. And that's where I'm more so worried is like, like, I, and, and I already know the Spurs too, that if he were to get injured, like an ankle injury or something where somebody goes under him, I think that they would very, be very cautious about when to bring him back. Like they definitely give him like the most time he needs. And then of course that would lead to an, another, um, you know, losing kind of season that, that doesn't mean, uh, you, know, you know, that kind of situation. So again, that's just more so my worry is that someone's going to hurt him on, on uh, you know, they're trying to put their, and, and again, not doing it intentionally, but they, the NBA defenders just don't know how to guard this guy. He's just someone they haven't seen where he's fading away from like, like the three point line. And, and he's like, you know, doing turnarounds and stuff and so that that's just my my one concern um for him uh i i like what you said there about the um part about about having him where he can kind of go from the three-point line defensively to to even inside uh do you maybe think that because i heard bill simmons mention this do you think they should experiment coach pop with like somewhere where like he's kind of like almost like a four 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 out zone and like him kind of in the middle because something like that where maybe they can always have him near the basket but also not specifically in the paint where he's kind of in the vicinity of like everyone what do you think about that or, or you think it's best just leave him like as a wing for now that'd be interesting I, I almost kind of think because they were switching every um like on ball off ball screen mm -hmm. with wings and guards but not with bigs i almost kind of think they were trying to do something like that where you're keeping him on the corners so if a guy gets the ball that he can contest that if the ball goes into the rim he can take a couple steps over i think this is such a unique prospect that the spurs are going to have to figure out how to do it you know like mm -hmm. when aldridge came in and pop said oh you know i tried to make him x y and z and i shouldn't have done that i should let him be aldridge you know but like there was comps for who lamarcus aldridge is i i think that the idea of you're going to try to keep him on a wing you know in the the wing part of the court the corners mm -hmm. so that he can like rotate over the zone thing is interesting but i think you know we've seen Giannis one defensive player of the year with kind of that free safety mentality where okay. you have a rim protector mm -hmm. and then he kind of is just a roamer and then he comes out of nowhere um and actually what you were saying about the guys getting under him also gave me a quick question that i i wanted to ask you real quick mm -hmm. do you what so one of the ways that he actually breaks offense that I just thought of as we were talking about this, who are the other teams? Because you said, you know, 30 or 60 players he's going to see a year. Who are the other teams going to put on him? Because yeah. if they put a wing on him, he has like, I mean, his release point is maybe like a foot or two foot, feet higher than their hands. But if they put a center on him, now all of a sudden, Zach Collins is going to look like I don't know. He's going to look like one of the five best centers in the NBA. He's going to get like 30 points a game because he's going to have a wing on him and he's just going to yam on him every time. Like, I, I think that even that, them playing him at the three or the four unlocks offense too because yes, who do you think other teams are going to put on Wimby knowing that Zach Collins is also going to be out there? No, that's a, that's a great question. It, it just goes back to game one. What I saw a lot was that the attention he draws and not just Zach, but I think all those backdoor layups, those things are going to be open. Uh, when uh, any simple pick and roll, they're gonna, they're, a lot of times the lead ball handler is going to have a better avenue to the rim because they're so worried about Wemby rolling. Um, so, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Like, uh, it, it, a lot of times they're going to probably just match up whoever's on him already. But Or they, they want to get him, like, in the half court. They want to get a taller player on him, I would assume. But a lot of times in the NBA, you don't have time for that when it's like somebody misses. You have to go right down. You have to get the next man. And he's very smart. I saw a few plays where he saw a guard on him, and he would purposely call everybody away so that he could draw on the defense and then kick out. There was Especially that, that play come back to me in game one. I'm very interested. I, I don't know. That, that's a really good question by you. Um, and yeah, I mean, and, and I think that obviously he's going to get like that early, like LeBron type of treatment where like teams are going to basically give him the jumper because they, they saw, you know, that he has some difficulty shooting the outside shot. So that's going to be the first part of it is like trying to get him as close as he can and operate uh, firsthand. I think that's, that's going to be the initial move by the defenders is to kind of give him that space from outside and, and try to limit him inside. So yeah, it'll be interesting, man. I, I, yeah. I mean, it's going to be fun. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. just all the opportunities going to open up and, and things like that. So, so we'll see what happens there. All right. So that was Wimby. All right, so now let's talk about just some summer league ratings so far. Uh, the stats I have here on this page, they're going to be from, from the Vegas summer league. Now, I know a lot of these guys um, that, that are listed here played in the California as well. But you can just kind of give me your overall summer league impressions from both California and Vegas. And, uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to do a little game here where we talk about what rating would you give the player uh, so far through summer league? Um, you know, are, is this player surpassing your expectations, above expectations? Or are, are they playing kind of expected, like you, you wanted to see this kind of growth in them? Or, or is that player under underperforming? And then just based on what you've seen so far in Summer League, 
what early role would you say this player is going to get with the Spurs? Are they going to be a starter? Are they going to be on the second unit, the third unit, or maybe in, in spend a lot of time in Austin? So let's begin with uh, the top leading scorer so far in summer league for the Spurs, who just had a great game after a, a pretty rough game. That's Malachi Branham. Um, he's averaging 17 three points um, so far in summer league on 17.7 shots, three rebounds, two, 2.7 assists to one turnover and one steal. Um, what rating would you give Branham so far to summer league from what you've seen? I would say expected. Okay. Um, specifically, you know, the the only hesitation is I, I almost expected him to have games like he had last game almost every time. You know, wing mm-hmm. the, the summer league is a wings and guards league, and you can tell like the guys who have played in the NBA are just so much better at summer league than the than the fringe players who don't have experience. I mean, Julian Champagny has showed that this yeah. this too. So I, I've almost expected that last game performance to kind of be the norm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it leave it on expected, uh, kind of shading down a little bit, but but I'm landing on expected there. Okay, and what what role do you see with him in the Spurs so far from what you've seen? I think the second unit, you know, he was starting at the end of last season, but I think uh, the starting unit is going to be a log jam, so he's going to be on the second unit. Okay, I'm with you there. Uh, kind of meeting those expectations, he looks like one of the players who just looks like, you know, he's more confident, comfortable. Um, I expect him to go off like those 27 points, but then I think also like the, the one of was like 16 shooting or whatever. That was also a weird game just because like when, it was Wemby's first game. He's getting all the hype. You know, he's getting more, more possessions. All the focus is on him. Like, honestly, I didn't even, I didn't even look at the box score. Cause I was like there in person, just kind of watching the, the, the jumbotron kind of thing. I didn't even know he went one to 16 until he talked about it. I was listening to his post game interview. He's like, yeah, everyone was bashing me on Twitter. And I was like, wait, wait what happened? And I looked at his box where I was like, oh, you went one to 16. And then he says he uses that as, as motivation that it's hard to, to steer away from that stuff. But yeah, I, I just feel like he just looks like one of those com- confident, comfortable players out there um, who, who's, who's like ready to take the leap. Um, I would also say that he's on that second unit just because of, like you said, the log jam there in the starting unit. All right, Dominic Barlow, who is still restricted free agent, like we mentioned, 16.3 points on 12 shot attempts, 7.3 rebounds, two assists to 1.3 turnovers, one block. What are your what are your um, ratings of, of Barlow and his and his early role? What do you see for him? I'm gonna say above expectations. You know, I, I expect after a year, like I said, the guys who the very first year in summer league is generally not as good as the people who come back. Uh, but I mean, even with that growth factored in, it's been the the bounciness, the mid-range jumper, the activity on defense. Um, it's basically kind of everything you want from him. Um, and he's displaying it on this stage, which has been really exciting to watch. I would say, so definitely above expectations. And for his role, I would, I would peg it at third unit. But because I think he's going to be on the two-way, I think that that kind of has to mean in Austin a lot. But mm-hmm. I think... You know, it's going to be a third unit kind of situation where can he at some point over the next year or two rise to that backup center level? You know, that's that's the big question, I think, for him. But I think if he wasn't on a two way, if he was on a main contract, I would say third unit. But because I think it's going to be two way, I'm going to say kind of in between the two. Okay. I'm with you there. Um, He just really surpassed my expectations. He just really stood out a lot. I mean, just the fact that. Um, in summer league, when you look at the NBA stats site, they only have players like just they group all the players together. They don't like let you pick the specific teams by filters. And man, he's like on the on the first or second page like of like leading scores. I didn't realize he was averaging 16 points a game. Like I know he's had, he's had out some st- some standout games, but yeah, just um just really confident offensively, doing a really good job off the ball, making cuts, kind of getting offensive putbacks. Uh, he's shown his mid range jumper there. Uh, defensively as well. And you see him starting there at the five next to Wemby and, and when Wemby was playing, um, he's just, yeah, yeah, like I said, above expectations for me. And like you, I think he w- he should be on the third unit, but because I think he's going to end up coming back on a two-way, I, I do see him in Austin just because there's, there, unless someone, you know, gets hurt up, up in the starting unit or somewhere or like in the second unit, then I could see them bringing him up. But because of just the log jam they have on the, on their roster, um, that it's it's pretty, pretty much full at, at this point, uh, I, I do see him there more so in the Austin uh, realm a lot. All right, Julian Champagne, 14 points on 11.3 field goal attempts, uh, 7.3 rebounds, five assists to 2.7 turnovers. What are your ratings and an early role for Champagne? Um, above expectation, especially, you know, I think it, the the high volume guys, um, you know, I'm looking at him and Malachi, I feel like we're really hurt in those games where like there was a lot of weird attention on Wimby and it was kind of like almost like a black hole. I know Wimby kind of was thrown off by that too. But in the games where Wimby hasn't been there, man, I mean, amazing, incredible shooting, um, kind of doing everything. You know, I know that one of the best shots in the NBA 
uh, for spot up shooters is when they have at least four feet of space. And I know that when he was getting really hot, it was like the defender was right there and he was like, I don't care. I'm just, I'm just pulling the trigger. And it was clean. And I think definitely above expectations on that regard. I think I'm going to say a little, little, uh, hot take prediction third unit until after the uh trade deadline. Okay, I think that the Spurs have too many wings on their roster, and some mm-hmm. of them would be beneficial to playoff teams. So I think that they're going to be able to like trade them for some you know draft capital slash young players. So I bet after the trade deadline, there might be a place for him to move into that. But I do think the Spurs might go with like a like a platoon type system where they can roll out. Oh you know, um, blocked shot is not falling today. In the second half, we're going to go with Champagne. Or, you know, okay. Jetty Osman is having an off game. In the second half, we're going to go to Champagne. Like, they have enough wings to do kind of creative stuff like that. But I think third unit as a default. Okay, I'm with you there where I think it's, uh, I think he's a, he's above expectations. Just, I mean, you look at all the guys shooting the ball at the summer league and he, the, the, his shot release is just so quick. He's learned, I mean, just like you said, a lot of these players are inexperienced on the summer league squad. So he knows exactly, almost like what, what, what we're like, he knows he knows exactly what angle he needs to make just to make a quick little like fake back cut and he gets wide, wide open. The Spurs kick it to him and he just, he pulls the trigger. And so I, I just been, um, I just think he looks really impressive right now at summer league. Um, I'm going to say as well, like you third unit, but, but I think he's going to put pressure on players where I think that like, let's just say one of the starters, like, like Kelton's met in his three point shots, not going down or maybe somebody, someone on the bench, uh, Reggie Bullock's off to a bad night. I think that he puts some pressure on those players. Cause I think pop knows, Hey, if I need switch, if I need shooting in that, in that, in one of those lineups, I have champagne who's ready to go. And I, and you know, I, I think just, he's that kind of player where, where the coaching staff knows they can rely on him if they, if they just need specifically outside shooting. And he's, he's a better bet there uh, in that regard than some of even some of the players that are above him. So that that's where I think that he can, he has potential to move up. Uh, and then also like you, I think that they're going to move a lot of these, these veteran players from the last year, their deal, try to trade them uh, come February. And so then he ends up getting, you know, moving up to the second, to the second unit. So yeah, champagne has been very impressive. All right. Blake Wesley. Um, 13.7 points on 13.7 field goal attempts, 5.3 rebounds, 3.7 assists to 2.3 turnovers, 1.3 steals. What are your ratings in early role for Wesley? I will say underperforming. I thought, you know, I felt like his summer league last year, there was a lot of promise there. He came into the season on this like kind of Spurs program for young guards that they have. <laughs> and then he got hurt early on. And I felt like that really affected his development. So I was thinking, okay, now he has kind of, you know, from April to now to kind of do some off-season work. We're going to come in here. We're going to see what it is. And there is a lot there to be excited about, especially athletically. Some things that are kind of hard to grow or teach, like that explosive first step. Um, it, it feels like a little bit of the processing is just a step slow in the sense that some of the passes he makes, you think, oh, that was the right pass. But you can, like, see the gears turning as he's like, ooh, this is the right pass. And, like, by the time he actually does that, it's, like, half a second too late. And I think he can improve that. Like, the fact that he's seeing the right pass is a thing, and it just needs to get quicker. But then he has that explosiveness, Mm -hmm. but the finishing isn't quite there yet. You know, I think maybe kind of like a post-prime Russell Westbrook where he's still getting to the rim at will. But it's like, you know, at the rim, his efficiency isn't as high as as a lot of other people who can get to the rim, I think we're kind of there as he learned some of the tricks. I think this is stuff that can be taught out of him where he's learning. Here's what you can do once you get to the rim. Here's how you make these quicker decisions. Cause that athleticism is special, but I was just hoping that we would see a little bit more of that playmaking prowess now. And I think he's probably still going to be in Austin a lot. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with you there as well. Kind of like in between it. So I'm going to say expected slash underperforming just because my expectations weren't very high for him. I just didn't know what, what kind of growth he was going to make in the off season. And, and, and like you said, it's just like, you look at the, you look at how, how the night ends up going and like, it's just the, either the shooting's off or there's the, the decision making. I mentioned this in the last first cast where like, he's very, he holds the ball a little bit too much before making that, that decision. Is he going to attack? Is he going to pass? And I just feel like you didn't see that, that stride where like you see from Barlow, from Branham, from, from Champagne, almost like last year where you saw those, those gains from, from Sohan, from, from, from Branham so quickly. And again, like you said, last year, it wasn't his fault. He was hurt early on in the season. And then also, I think what leads to this is just a quote. I listened to, um, to uh, the, the summer league coach, Matt Nielsen. And uh, I was just pulled up here on Twitter and it was, I actually heard on video and I was like, Whoa, like the coach actually said that about him. So he said this, he said, he's learning. He's got to keep developing. He's had his ups and downs. There have been some good moments where he is getting it and doing a good job. And then probably just creeps into some, some other bad habits or some other habits, not bad habits. So again, even the coaching staff 
is basically kind of admitting, which I didn't think they would, you know, he, he would say that Nielsen, that, you know, he's having a, a rough, you know, there's been good and, and bad. And so that's what I don't think you want to see from a second year player. Whereas like, you, like we said, Brandon and them, like they stand out right away. He he's not. So that's where I feel like, yeah, it's, I just don't like, when you look at the lineup, I like, I know what Trey Jones does. He's like your, your typical, you, you know, low volume scoring kind of, kind of QB for your team. He sets everybody over the knee. You look at Devontae Graham, you know what he does. He's, he's that high shooter. He's going to, he's going to, you, you, you run a pick and roll for him. He's going to shoot that three if, if, if the defense goes under, but you at least know what he's going to do. Wesley, I don't know what he's going to do. So that's why I, I'm, I'm with you where I think he's on the third unit, but pop gets to that point where like, he's not playing. He's like, okay, we got to send him to Austin. Cause he's just not playing. He needs to get some minutes somewhere. And so, yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of there like in that expected slash underperforming kind of role. All right. Last player. Uh, CD Sissoko, um, 3.3 points on 3.7 field goal attempts, 5.3 rebounds, two assists uh, to one turnover and one steal. What are your ratings and early role for him? You know, I know you and I aren't quite as big into the draft. We have been on Project Spurs staff for that. I know I heard some buzz as that he'd be a good second round target for the Spurs and people are excited that they picked him up. But I still just don't know much about the draft at all. So I was kind of coming in with a little bit of a blank slate. Um especially because, you know, he played with these players or he was in the G League Ignite like um, Scoot was. And, you know, he he was like quite a bit distant from him in pick uh, like the 44th pick instead of the third pick. But above expectations, I didn't really have a whole lot of expectations. Incredible play, incredible defense, incredible playmaking. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and I definitely think in Austin a lot for him just to develop that offense in a place where it's less risky. Okay. So, so you say uh, above expectations for seeding also probably in Austin a lot. I'm with you there as well. Um, just like, like you, like you said, I didn't watch any, I didn't watch him, uh, you know, in, in the draft process, I didn't watch any of his games last year with G league Ignite. Uh, so, but, but I have been impressed with his playmaking a little bit. I know that offensively I didn't expect him to be a good shooter, like a finisher there at the rim. Um, he also had some, some really interesting comments in one of his interviews where he like, he knows that he's not like, you know, he, he's coming off the bench. Um, he's the second round pick. So he knows that he's not going to get like 20 shots a game. Like maybe some of the other players will get on the team. And so he's trying to just impact winning as much as possible. And I feel like he does that a lot, especially on the defensive end. I just, he like really hustles. He really locks down guys um, prevents them from, from getting by him. But like you, I think he ends up on a two-way contract, so I'm going to say that he probably ends up in Austin a lot. But I will say, if there's like certain matchups where they just need a defender out there, I could see Pop calling him up multiple times throughout the season just to kind of be that that player uh, defensively to to just just to, to, to just be on one assignment specifically. So um, those are our summer league ratings so far. Again, they have uh, I think two more summer league games left to Spurs. All right, so let's go to our final topic here, and this is uh, some some more details on the in season tournament. That was announced over the weekend on Saturday. Uh, the NBA had a big presentation about this. And so we did at least find out who the Spurs' group will be in some more dates and, and just uh, so, some more details on, on the in-season tournament. All right, so the Spurs are going to go ahead and be in Group C in the Western Conference. And what that means is they're going to play games against the Sacramento Kings, the Golden State Warriors, Minnesota Timberwolves, and Oklahoma City Thunder. All very good teams, all playoff-level teams. So... Oof, that's a that's a tough group to be in, which which we kind of knew that when you see the the, the groups, it, it's it's noticeable who like the bad teams were from last year, because that's how they grouped them is based on last year's standings. Um, and so so just some details on this. Um, the Spurs will play two home games and two road games against these these four teams. Uh, it's going to be built into the schedule on Tuesdays and Fridays, starting from November third through twenty eighth. For uh, if you if you finish top in, in your group, or uh, you could be one of the wild card teams with, with having the second best record in group play, then you move on to the knockout round. If you're in the knockout round, um, it's a single elimination type of knockout round. If you don't make the knockout round, then uh, you're still going to play two regular season games in your schedule. And then the final four will be on December 9th, I mean, December 7th um, in Las Vegas. And also the championship game will be on a Saturday, December 9th in Las Vegas. I'm just going to say now, Colin, because I live closer to Vegas these days. If the Spurs make it to the championship, which I don't think, or even the final four, I'm going to try to, I'm going to definitely get over there. But if not, I mean, you know, this again, where their seating is, it's going to be pretty tough for them. All right. So uh, just give me your thoughts. What are, you, what are your thoughts about the groups San Antonio's in? And also just, you know, just the, the fact that this is coming to, to our season this coming season. Yeah, I, I'm actually really excited for this tournament. I think the fact that we know that Tuesdays and Fridays in March are like group play is a really exciting idea, or not in March, in November. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the fact that at the beginning of December, we have this tournament, like you and I are going to watch November and December basketball all of the time because yes. that's what we do. But like, I think if you give us a, a couple of stakes in the game, you know, it's like, oh, that's even cooler. Like, you know, there is going to be a team that no one expects that's going to make the final eight because that's just the way these things break. You have to mm -hmm. win. And like, 
Okay. The Spurs now have ESPN's new darling child on their team and Wimby. Like, imagine if, you know, they're all good teams, like you said, but these are just one game. You know, these aren't a series. So imagine if the Spurs start 2-0 and in these group plays. They just win their first two games. Now, all of a sudden, how are those games three and four going to be covered? Or what if they make it to the, the final eight with Wimby on there? Like, like yeah. there's so much room for chaos here. And then I think... Right now, it might not mean a whole lot, but we can get to the point where there's a triple crown type system where, you know, winning the in-season tournament, the NBA Cup and the MVP and the championship is like the crowning jewel of a season or something, you know, and there's going to be a player some year who's going to be gunning for that. And we're going to be watching it all year long. And it's going to be a story. Like, I think it's awesome. I think the Spurs group is really tough. I kind of like, you know, because like what you were saying there, Every team has been in like first through third record, fourth through six, you know, so on and so forth into three record, uh, three team groups. And then they're pulled from a hat. I think the Spurs would be a much better position if um, they would have had Memphis just because jaw isn't going to be around for the first 25 games. Now, this is going to be a little bit tougher, but like, like we said, only if they win two games, all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, and we, we know how competitive, like that's one of the things that I think struck me watching Wimby mm-hmm. after the Spurs got the number one pick is that guy is a gamer. Like yes. he wants to yes. go out. You tell him there's a, like, people are like, oh, our player is going to care about this. If you tell Wimby Yama, there's an end season tournament, he's going to want to win that. And like, I, I think it's just kind of cool. I, I really do think that there's going to be a team that everyone considers a bad team. Who's going to make it to the final eight. And it's going to, it's going to be an incredible run to watch. I'm so excited for that. And and it's exciting to see, you know, I really hope the Spurs do win their first two, just to give, you know, a little bit of intrigue in that. If they go 0-2, then it's like, oh, I guess I don't care from a Spurs perspective anymore. But yeah, I, I just think having impactful November basketball is is so cool because I'm going to watch it anyway. And I'm glad that there's yeah. at least a reason to be more invested. <laughs> okay. So I have some comments here too, as well. Um, so, so regarding the national televised games, I believe um, I had just read the press release again, but I believe it's uh, all eight of those um, elimination games, the, the knockout round are televised, nationally televised, but I'd have to go back and check anyway. We'll figure it out. Uh, so, so here's one, one thing that concerns me a little bit. Uh, like you said, for the reason why they're doing this is that they want like the the more I would say like the football audience. Like there, there's people out there who don't watch basketball until football is literally over. Like you know, come after Christmas or around Christmas time. But you and I are, are, don't fall in that camp. I think a lot of Spurs fans don't because San Antonio consistently is one of the best markets to watch basketball. We see that when the in the finals when like they're not even their team's not even in it, and S- San Antonio was like number two or three in watching the NBA finals behind like Miami and Denver or something like that. So you see that the Spurs Spurs fans are going to be there. They're going to watch basketball, but other other fans just uh, a lot of uh, everywhere else they don't. Really really key in until football season's over so I, I understand why they're doing this um you know so early in the season what worries me so is that we don't get like that experimentation time for the teams now like normally remember the season starts like october 20 something like 22nd 23rd those kind of ranges and it's usually like three or five games in, in october and like to start on november 3rd is not giving those teams like that 10 to 15 game window to like figure out their lineups you know give them a few few days to like struggle a little bit at the gate and so I really feel like it puts a little bit more pressure on the teams to put out competitive groups faster, which is fun. But I also feel like that kind of messes with team like, like building and chemistry. That That's a kind of worries me in, the, in that frame. I, I wouldn't mind. I think maybe if they put it to like mid-November or like start of the tournament around there. But because so, I hadn't looked at the schedule and the fact that they start on November 3rd, it's like, wow, like that's just like a week out from the season starting. Like that's pretty quickly. I mean, that's really fast. Uh, again, it's going to be fun, though, because like you said, it's it's just way more fun now that we're going to have something um, like I, I'm actually rooting for this just because I want this first win because I need I need I want to go to Vegas. Like that would be fun again in December. So <laughs> I'm actually rooting that they do well in this. I know we're not supposed to be rooting for teams, but. Um, I just want to be able to have a reason to go to Vegas uh, in December. So um, yeah, I'm really all for this. Like I said, just my only drawback would be just be the fact that they're starting so early, but, but yeah, I mean, if it's going to bring in a bigger audience, I think, and it's just going to be, make it a lot more fun. And like you said, the, the Spurs are going to probably get a lot more national televised games this year, just because of the fact they have Wemby on their team. They're not just going to, you know, be like, like in past season. So yeah, I think it'll be something fun to watch and, and we'll see how it goes uh, uh, for, for here for this in season tournament. All right, so I do want to say thank you to Colin Reed for joining me here on this episode of the Spurs Cast. I also want to say thank you to Joe Garcia for mixing and producing this episode. Please subscribe, rate, and review the Spurs Cast on podcast platforms and YouTube. From all of us at Project Spurs, stay safe and have a great day.